Are you guys ready to start? We're ready. Okay, question number one. How many board of you obstructed lung diseases? Start with the first option, we're a bit late. Oh, wow, that was quick. <laughs> The U.S. FDA approved the first of a new class of a drug, the phosphodiesterase inhibitor, to reduce the acute exacerbation of COPD. This approval was based on two clinical trials showing reduced and exacerbations of COPD in which of the following patients? A, they are receiving combination therapy with inhaled corticosteroid and long-acting anticholinergic, or the patient with either bronchitis or emphysema COPD phenotype, meaning doesn't matter. C, with only COPD gold stage three or four severity. And D, with four or more exacerbation requiring oral steroids in the previous year, regardless of the gold stage. What do you guys think? D. C. D. C. C. Any other votes? Okay. Correct answer is C, with only gold stage three to four. So what do you need to know about the phosphodiesterase inhibitors and COPD patients who are having exacerbation? First of all, the name is Roflumilast. I've tried to prescribe it so many times in the clinic, it was never approved by insurance, let me tell you this. And uh, how it works, really nobody knows the mechanism of action of that, but we know that it modulates inflammation and that's why we think it works on exacerbation. So pay attention to the word exacerbation, this is only where it applies. The criteria to select patients, when do you think about it when you see your COPD patient who's having very frequent exacerbation? They have to have uh, gold stage three to four, meaning their FAV has to be less than 50%. They have to be chronic bronchitis phenotype, not the emphysema phenotype mainly. And they have to have at least two exacerbation the previous year, meaning that disease is not under control. And uh, if we think about the combination, if you go back to the question, asking you here, giving you the choice whether it has to be given a combination therapy with inhaled corticosteroid and long-acting anticholinergic. When you examine the literature, actually you see that the earlier studies done on phosphodiesterase inhibitors were looking into the FEV1 improvement. And in these studies, they enrolled patients on combination therapy. They were on inhaled corticosteroids and antiphosphodiesterase inhibitors. But did they find any improvement in FAV1? No, it doesn't change it at all. So they tried to look into something else, which is a prevention of exacerbation. And when they did these studies, unfortunately, the patients they enrolled, they prohibited the use of inhaled corticosteroid and anticholinergic. So the answer is we don't know if we should add the phosphodiesterase inhibitor to the combination or not. Does it give a better effect, worse effect? We don't know. So you should focus when it comes to phosphodiesterase inhibitor use gold stage 3, 4, FEV1 less than 50%, they having two, more, two or more exacerbation a year, and of course the bronchitis phenotype, and that's why they have more exacerbation. Question about this slide? So they took the patients off the standard of care. And the, what, what do you mean? The steroids. And then health corticosteroids. Uh, to be honest, I did not look into these studies specifically. I don't that's know what. probably a no. because if they, uh, they're going to find the effects. More chance of finding an effect on the drug market if they compare to placebo. Then they add it on top of ICS and the bottom. Now, if they had an effect, they would have a gold market. If they got a negative effect, they don't want to extract it. Now we extrapolate and say, let's add a few years for a top without knowing if it actually works. So we need to, that's why we don't get this very often. Because we're all on combination therapy, so we don't have any data to know if uh, adding it. He does not have history of a frequent exacerbation and has not had any recent illnesses or worsening cough or sputum production. He reports that he's compliant to his medication, which is Aspiriva and Advair, and physical examination is unchanged from prior examination. When they, they did this fire in the office this time, the ratio was FEV1 to FV6, uh, FVC is 60% predicted, which is not different from one year ago. VO2 was on room air 55, and they did a 2D echo and subsequent right-sided heart failure based on that 2D echo required, and they found that he has severe pulmonary hypertension. His mean pulmonary artery pressure was 50. 
So in addition to oxygen, what are you going to initiate on this patient? What are you going to do for this patient? None. Start Bosentin, give him Sildenafil or Epiproxenol. None. None. Any other votes? A. A? None. <laughs> okay, so I think we all agree here that the correct answer is A, none. And I'm trying to give a point, a talk about the pulmonary hypertension and the COPD group of patients and the things that you need to know about it. Yes, it's a very common problem in, pH, in COPD patients, but generally pulmonary hypertension in this group of patients is mild and only less than 5%, they will have a very high elevation of pulmonary artery pressure that's out of prop proportion to their disease severity. So their COPD is not that bad, but the pulmonary hypertension is bad. So really small percentage of these patients. And these patients usually, they have moderate reduction in FAD1, but they have severe hypoxemia and a very low diffusion capacity. This m makes you think about pulmonary hypertension. Now, what do we do for these patients like any other uh, group of pulmonary hypertension that's not pulmonary arterial hypertension, you target the underlying cause for the problem, treat the disease itself, Is it treat COPD. And is this evidence-based? Yes. The evidence says that there's no sufficient data to support the safety or efficacy of a treat, uh, vascular targeted therapy in COPD patients related pH. This is mainly studied in the British pH registry. The, I think the reveal registry in America here does not talk about the use of vascular targeted therapy in this group of patients. So take home message, COPD, pulmonary hypertension, common, usually it's mild. They have hypoxia, low diffusion. We treat the underlying disease. We don't do vascular targeted therapy for this group of patients. That's the ratio. Most of these patients who are just not COPD, most of the phenotype here are female, obese, they have some heart problem. And so if you're saying it's out of proportion, I think, I, 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 Dr. Kahiga has addressed that issue too, that we don't know what to do with these patients. And if they're better, if there's a choice there, enroll them in, you know, like a trial, which is ongoing. I think that's the best answer. So I think, and, and again, one of the other caveats to this is that the FEV1 does not correlate exactly. with the degree of pH. What, what's the better predictor is the DLCO, because the DLCO is the predictor of the hypoxemia, and the hypoxia is the mechanism for the pulmonary, the, the pH, it's the pulmonary vasoconstriction. Exactly. So that's what this question is trying to get at, which is probably why they didn't give you the DLCO to begin with, or the FEV1 for that matter. Because what they're really trying to get you to think about is the severity of the hypoxia. That's why they give you the PaO2 of 55 on the, on the blood gas. Yes, exactly. This is what I was going to say, that the FEV1 does not really correlate with the degree of pulmonary artery uh, pressure elevation. And like you mentioned, it's important to understand the pathophysiology of pH in um, COPD patients. Uh, it's related to the hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. And hypoxia correlates better with the degree of elevation of the pulmonary artery pressure better than the FEV1. And generally, these <coughs> patients were when you suspected an older population of pH, when you cap them, they might have slight elevation of the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. And in general, it's really poor prognosis for patients with COPD. Question three, 64 year old woman with a significant COPD, her FAV1 is 810 milliliters, 31% predicted. She was admitted to the local <coughs> hospital with an acute exacerbation. She had two days history of increased cough, more sputum production, change in the sputum character, it was more yellow, more thick, and it was accompanied by worsening shortness of the breath, so typical exacerbation. She had approximately one or two exacerbation per year. The most recent was eight months ago. She never has been intubated and is not treated chronically with oral glucocorticoids. 
When she was admitted, her physical exam is notable for diffuse expiratory wheezes, no focal consolidation. They did a chest x-ray. Chest x-ray does not show significant changes from her baseline. She does not have new infiltrate. She is treated as an inpatient, admit her for 72 hours. She was on oral moxie because of the change in sputum. Gave her oxygen, they gave her inhaled nebula, inhaled the treatment, albuterol and epitrophin and IV methylprednisone. And it's clinically getting better. The question is, how long should the patient receive a total course of a glucocorticoid, meaning IV plus oral? A, three days, B, five days, two weeks, or eight weeks? Five days. Five? Two weeks. Two weeks? Other votes? So we're between five days and two weeks correct answer is two weeks. So in general, the treatment, steroid therapy for acute exacerbation of COPD. Well, I thought we were going to say five days because that study that came out. Yeah, yeah. that was about to say that. Is that yeah. question before that study? Yes, yeah. I yeah. think so. Yeah. So, so that was the question wrong, now it's five days. Yeah, it's five So I, I, I laugh because, you know, the well, answer would be five days, but every time we bring it up, the senior staff would give us. You know. Well, the, the data supports five days, but the protocol I have to extend is because uh, the thinking is that this study was done on uh, uh, Swedes, I think, Swedish? Yes, that's correct. Socialized medicine, everyone's compliant with everything, there's no social disorder. <laughs> but I hear we have, you know, the city different outcomes, so that was the justification for doing the 10 days. So this is an acute exacerbation in any patient. No, the other thing is, I don't think those patients who were in the original trial were on IV steroids. Oh, no, they, they were admitted, they were put on. Uh, I think they were put on IV and then they were converted at some point. So long as she put it on home, okay. and then the six month readmission rate, and I, I think they also worked for one year, uh, was no different. Mm -hmm. But the total dose of steroids was higher in, this, in the longer, I think it was a two weeks versus five days. And yeah. there was no difference in readmission rates. I specifically chose this question because of the because it keeps coming up again and again and again, and I well, wanted to know how to answer it for the board. The justification is that they haven't studied this kind of population yet, and there may be a difference. Maybe this, guy, this you know, population, you know, the socioeconomic status, not an adherence to ADRA because they can't afford a copay, and the president doesn't know what's keeping them out. You know, there, there's other reasons why longer than five days might work for different populations. Okay. But I guess, but does that mean for the boards, like? They're probably, I mean, the reduced trial was points just points published. Yeah. You know, that Jeff is talking about, the reduced trial was just published two years ago. That was a non-inferiority study looking at five days versus 14 and hospital readmissions in six months. And five was non-inferior to 14, which is what leads to the rationale for how five days came about. But I doubt that on boards, they're gonna give you a question that's gonna ask you about a study that was just done two years ago. Because okay. the board questions lag quite a bit behind the literature. Mm -hmm. And it's just one study and doesn't address other right. populations. Okay. So if they give you you know, a stem like that, there's, it's gonna be obvious. It's not gonna be two weeks or five days. It's gonna be two weeks versus three days mm -hmm. or, or, or something Or eight like weeks. Or the real old study about the six weeks versus uh, Eight weeks one versus week, eight weeks versus hyperglycemia. Yeah, yeah. 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 and yeah. this is the one actually. This is yeah. looked into the week two weeks and eight weeks, and it looks into the length of the stay, a lot more improvement in the spirometry, and it tells us about the hyperglycemia. That's more in the steroid mm -hmm. group in general, not only in the eight weeks. But uh, this is specifically for inpatients with acute exacerbation. There are also other studies for outpatient. For instance, patients go into the emergency room and they saw that there is lower rates of prolapse if they were given 10 days. But then the conclusion in the board review says that the data do not support shorter course than two weeks of tapering dose of steroids for COPD exacerbation. And this includes both IV and oral combined, and they are trying to give you the point that the oral is not inferior to IV. So I think we'll stick for that, the board. Yeah. Yeah, the, the history behind 10 days is that you have this thing showing that eight weeks is no good, and you have other studies showing that three days too short, study. correct. So they would say 10. 10 days in the middle. Three days is probably too short, and we know that two to eight weeks is long, so we're going to pick 10. But this is for the outpatient, so in general. <coughs> Question four. Which of the following patients assessed following rehabilitation would be the best candidate for long volume reduction surgery?
We'll be back after these commercials. <laughs> A, a 60-year-old man, he had an upper lobe emphysema, exercise capacity following rehabilitation was 30 watts, the FEV1 is 30% predicted and BLCO is 28. B, 52-year-old woman, diffuse emphysema, exercise capacity 50 watts following rehabilitation, FEV1 28%, BLCO 30%. C, 58-year-old man, upper lobe emphysema, Exercise capacity 60 following rehabilitation, FEV1 32%, DLCO 40%. And finally, 68 year old man, diffuse emphysema, exercise capacity 30, following we have FEV1 18 and DLCO 15%. Votes? So what do you say, sir? A. You say A? Why do you say A? A Really, it, this question, you have to know the criteria for lung volume reduction surgery, and I'm trying to, you're right, the answer is A. Talk about the NET trial in here, the study that looked into lung volume reduction surgery. It's a larger trial, 1,218 patients. The question, is specific, if you look at the question back, like we tried to break it down and look at all the data they give us, that's uh, so easy, even if you don't know the criteria for lung volume reduction surgery, I think you can, it's easy, you can easily eliminate at least two. I think about it this way, lung volume reduction surgery, you're looking for a bad part of the lung to take out. So initially, of course, you will take any, out any patient with diffuse emphysema. And then you have to remember the rest of the things that Sir Phil just mentioned correctly. And I was trying, when I was pointing to the age and gender, I was trying to say what you said about the gender that we only use it to get the predicted what of work that's done after rehabilitation. And the age, even though it might be confusing here, but the cutoff age is really 75, so really don't pay attention to all, any of that. Uh, this is the selection criteria. That's interesting about this slide. This is a perfect illustration of risk benefit. Mm -hmm. The diffused upper is benefit because uh, there's no benefit for dissecting why the outcome is different with the uh, exercise capacity thing is the risk. Um, the, the patients who have very good exercise tolerance don't need it. Right. So what you have there is the outcome is different in that group because the surgical complications went above the, the justification for the risk benefit. Okay. Yeah, and I'll go over the subgroup analysis and the NET trial. It's just in general, the age is 75. They have quit smoking for three to six months, severe destiny despite maximal treatment, and they have to require less than 20 milligram prednisone per day. And then you go to the testing part. So the FEV1 has to be less than 45% predicted, and the RV more than 150, TLC more than 100%, PO2 more than 45, CO2 less than 60. And after the post rehabilitation, six minute walk test should be 100, more than 140 meter. And low post rehabilitation maximal achieved cycle because, like you said, the pa patients who can work, they don't really need it. They don't need the risk of the surgery itself. And on imaging, on high resolution CT, upper lobe emphysema is generally preferred. So the NET trial outcome it said that the lung volume reduction surgery improves exercise capacity and no survival advantage in general. But when you do subgroup analysis, you see the difference in subgroups like you were trying to tell us that if there's upper low predominant and they are really doing poorly, meaning low baseline exercise capacity after rehabilitation, they do have survival benefit. On the other hand, if it's diffuse, you can't do anything about surgically and they are having good exercise capacity. They have increased mortality because the risk of surgery is higher. The other two groups, whether diffuse or upper, with high baseline, low baseline, they are same mortality, just improvement in the exercise capacity, no mortality benefit. What was the previous slide about the six-mile walk test? It has to be more than 140 meters after rehabilitation. Two 
to be accounted for the events of lots, right? Mm -hmm. One of the two. Correct. What was the lots so criteria? The lots was 40% higher. Um, I really don't remember the numbers. I'm not sure about the lots. I know that they are predicted for gender and age, so right, you so can calculate it. It's just general screening and how you go through the process of selecting patients for lung volume reduction surgery. It's complicated. They're trying to tell you that you need the surgeons, you need the nurses, you need rehabilitation, and you need to go all over the testing that we mentioned, the imaging, the FEV1, the six-minute walk test, the, board, the component of the bone scar. Yeah. So when you see this on boards, again, the question is really going to focus on how do you identify the patient that has <coughs> has heterogeneous emphysema, meaning emphysema in the upper lobes with a poor exercise tolerance. That's where they're going to lead you down um, in this kind of questioning. Sorry, I'm still stuck up on the six minute walk test. If it's less, let's suppose it's 100, then they're not a candidate at that point? Well, this is the selection of criteria, meaning that probably they're when they're too high risk. risk. And there are other things that are not mentioned here. For instance, the DLCO, if it's less than 20% also, Correct. it's a very poor outcome, so you don't. And the age, even though they say it's 75, I mean, it's not a straight cutoff. You just weigh the risk and benefit, so. Question five. 57-year-old patient has COPD, and after browsing a patient-focused website, ask you about the two about the value of starting inhaled corticosteroid as a monotherapy to treat his disease. He has a 45-year smoking history, but quit two years ago. He is symptomatically limited to climbing stairs or doing moderate exercise. He uses his albuterol approximately five times each week, and he has had one exacerbation requiring antibiotic in the past two years. His aspirometer reveals FEV1 2.5, which is 64% predicted, FEVC 4.46, 90% predicted, FEV1 to FVC a ratio of 56, with no significant response to inhaled bronchodilators. So what, what's your response to this suggestion from the patient in adding inhaled corticosteroids as a monotherapy for a patient with COPD? It will lead to a slower wake up decline of lung function compared to LABA. His risk of osteoporosis over the next three years will be increased. The likelihood of a three-year survival will be less compared with the use of inhaled corticosteroid with combination of LABA. It will increase her risk of COPD exacerbation. I know these are all ones. I just paid attention. <laughs> Sorry. Votes? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Second. Osteoporosis? <laughs> Osteoporosis? Yeah. Okay. Alright. Which number one is it? <laughs> <laughs> so three, the third one. The likelihood of a three year survival will be less compared with the use of inhaled corticosteroid and LABA as a combination. So we're looking at the inhaled corticosteroid for COPD patients. And if you go back to the choices going over them one by one, the first one lead to slower rate of decline lung function compared to LABA. You know that there's no medication that does that. Only smoking cessation will decrease the decline in FEB1. So, and then we look about, we, we need to know about the TORCH trial. So major findings of TORCH trial. And uh, we look into the probability of death, all causes death. They did a couple of arms in the study. One of the arms of COPD patients had the inhaled corticosteroid and LABA and the other one had the inhaled corticosteroids only. And they looked into three year probability of death. In this group combination, it was 12.6%, and this arm with inhaled corticosteroid alone was 16%. Gives a hazard ratio of 0.7 with a significant p-value. Meaning, the probability of death in three years in this arm, the inhaled corticosteroid alone, is higher than this. So that's why we chose that answer. Now this is all causes mortality though. This is not COPD related mortality. Also the TORCH trial tells us that inhaled corticosteroids are linked to increased risk of pneumonia. And they do not 
and health critic assert by themselves, their ability to reduce risk of exacerbation is not more than lab alone. If anything, combining the lab and health critic assert has a benefit, increased benefit in reducing risk of exacerbation. So torch combination is better. Either one of them is not better in reducing exacerbation, but the arm of inhaled corticosteroid alone, three years probability of death is higher. That's all causes mortality, not COPD related mortality. Question six. With regard to the safe use of long acting beta agonists in the treatment of asthma, which of the following is correct? The use of LABA should be considered with or without contempt use of inhaled corticosteroid. B, fixed dose combination product of LABA and inhaled corticosteroid should be avoided when possible in children and adolescents in order to preserve maximal flexibility in dosing of both the LABA and the inhaled corticosteroid. C, the LABA should be stopped if possible once asthma control is achieved with maintenance with inhaled corticosteroid after this point. LABA can be used in lieu of a low dose of medium dose inhaled corticosteroid in the patient who has asthma is adequately controlled with LABA monotherapy after a four week trial. C, C. C, the LABA should be stopped if possible once asthma control is achieved with maintenance of inhaled corticosteroid after this point and I say that you're all right. And this comes from the FDA label on the LABA as a monotherapy for asthma patients and this is what it says. You should not use it alone for asthma in any age without the use of an asthma controller medication, which is the inhaled corticosteroid. Also, we should stop it once the asthma control has achieved and maintain the use of asthma control medication like the inhaled corticosteroid. So you're going back on the stepwise approach of asthma after three months of um, confirming that the asthma is under control. And it recommends against the use of LABA in patients whose asthma is adequately controlled with a low dose of low dose or a medium dose of inhaled corticosteroid. Once it's achieved, you don't have to step up anymore. We're good at this point. Recommend that the fixed dose combination product be used to ensure compliance with the control of therapy, especially in adolescents and pediatric population. I always wondered about this part. When we, they come to the clinic and we have insurance issues with Simbacort or Advair, can we prescribe them alone? And it turns out that the FDA is recommends against that because what if the patient takes only the lab and does not take the inhaled corticosteroid? Where does this recommendation come from? It comes from the SMART trial. SMART trial, they studied Salmetrol versus placebo in asthma patients for 28 weeks. And the most important finding that there was increased asthma-related death in the Salmetrol arm. So we think that the use of inhaled corticosteroid along with the LABA does ameliorate the effect we see in this study. However, this is just a hypothesis. There is no evidence behind it. Actually, the FDA encourages the drug companies to look into that because we don't have any evidence. But if we know anything, we know that they should not use the lab by itself. Yeah. And the, again, the way they'll probably ask a question like this is that they'll, they'll try to get you to think about persistent asthma. I mean, that's really what the SMART trial was looking at. If we all know that inhaled corticosteroids are indicated for the management of patients with persistent asthma. So that's where the controversy in the SMART trial com comes to begin with because you wouldn't treat somebody with persistent asthma with placebo. That's not standard mm -hmm. therapy. So they'll, at, they'll give you a question where they're talking about this patient has asthma, they'll probably give you some evidence of obstruction on the PFT and they'll say, they have nocturnal awakening four nights out of the week and they may have some daily daytime symptoms two days out of the week for most weeks in a month. They're getting you to think about persistent asthma and then they'll launch into that kind of stem. What's the appropriate management strategy for that patient? Mm -hmm. that's, that's how they'll ask these types of questions. Mm -hmm. You are seeing a 43-year-old female patient for poorly controlled asthma. She has had asthma since childhood with frequent ED visits and repeated courses of prednisone, most recently three months ago. There are no clear precipitating factors for her flares of asthma and she tends to improve slowly after each exacerbation. Currently, she's taking Advair 550 by discus, delivery, and pro-air as needed. 
that she takes anywhere from one to four times a day. Her pharmacy records indicate that she has a good compliance. She takes her medication, she fills them in. She lives in a basement apartment with carpets, uses a foam pillow, and has no pets. Physical exam, she's morbidly obese, her BMI is 40.2. She has decreased breath sounds bilaterally. Allergy scan test was done and revealed a positive histamine control and reaction to dust and dust mites. FAB1, 1.73 liters, 79% predicted. 79, uh, the FBC is 2.5 liters, 90% predicted. The ratio of FEV1 to FBC is obstructive at 67%. FEV1 improves to 1.87 liter, 85% predicted after four pops of albuterol. Mm -hmm. The induced sputum reveals 2% eosinophilia. What change to her therapy would be most likely to improve her asthma control? Double the dose of luticasone, add a proton pump inhibitor, begin dust mite immunotherapy, start her on weight loss program. All agree? All right, start her on weight loss program. So a couple of words on weight management in asthma patients. First of all, obesity by itself is a risk factor to develop asthma <coughs> in women to start with. And if they have it and they are obese, then the chance to control their asthma is really low. They will have poor control in asthma despite what you are doing to her, like the doses she was taken for her inhalers. And weight loss has been associated with better asthma control and reduce the need of medication. But when you look at the bronchial hyperreactivity part of their asthma, it's not changed by weight loss. Only bariatric surgery changes that. But the control need for medication does correlate with weight loss. But these patients also, you have to understand why they do have poor control of their asthma because their airways do not have as much eosinophil as other asthma patients. And if you're giving them inhaled corticosteroids, medications that are targeted to find this eosinophil and work in them, they don't have enough of them. Obviously, they are not going to respond. And um, yes, obese patients are more likely to be on PPI. They will have GERD symptom. But really, does PPI affect the pulmonary function test, the spiro FEV1? It doesn't. The only thing it works on is reduce the cough in these patients. They have cough and cause cough and control it, it will go away, but you will not see really improvement in FEV1 or lung function, or number of exacerbation and the need for medication. Finally, the role of dust mite minimization strategy is really not that significant. I don't think there will be a question where the answer will be that. Right. Questioning. 39-year-old female patient with asthma has increased need for his inhaled bronchodilators, despite an increase in his inhaled corticosteroid just four weeks ago. He reports increased cough and sputum production, but has had not any fever or hemoptysis. He also doesn't have any sinus congestion, does not have any post-nasal drip or reflux symptoms. His PCP, when saw him after four weeks, is not getting better, or the chest x-ray. The chest x-ray was concerning. They found a lung mass. He's 39. The patient was sent for a CT scan. And his current regimen includes Advair 550, albuterol sulfate inhaler, two puffs every four hours PRN, Montelicastin milligram daily. Physical exam, he's still actively wheezing and bronchi in the upper lung fields. And the spirometry shows a moderate obstruction with significant response to bronchodilators. And the FAV1 is even is reduced by 300 mL compared to the study done four weeks ago when they titrated up his medication. These are the lab findings. White cell count seven, hemoglobin 16.4, platelets normal 275. This is the differential. ESR sed rate normal at 10, so your active protein is normal as well. So remember, they're always going to give you the information that you need. They rarely will not, they rarely will exclude the information that you need to make the diagnosis. This is his CAT scan. Remember the PCP ordered a chest x-ray and it did show a lung mass. No, if anyone wants to comment on the CAT scan findings? Rodeo, you look like you were chomping at it. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's, uh, level of the carina I reckon is the middle lobe uh, yeah, right there. Right. Some looks ground glass in some areas. Uh, it seems like airway, uh, the airway is involved. I see, I see there's a bronchus that seems to be leading to that. Uh, also in the left 
uh, the linear area there at mm -hmm. the periphery. Uh, you see that too. I don't think this huh? person has bronchi bronchiectatic, but it seems that the bronchus, uh, the right middle bronchus seems to be thicker. So you don't think this is a bronchiectasis? No, that one is bronchiectasis, the one on the left. Uh, huh? That one, that one, yeah. Okay. But this one on the right seems to be thickened, but I mean, the caliber of the, the artery accompanying it seems to be similar. Okay. I think this patient is ABPA. Okay. Other findings on the CAT scan? Um, Something jumps at you. What is this? So what gives you bronchial? I think that's blood. Yeah, mucus blood. Yeah. So exactly like you said, we have some bronchiectasis. It's in the middle lobe. Mm -hmm. We have a mucus plug in there and some infiltrate. The question is, the most appropriate diagnostic test in this patient, serum IgE level, serum acinutrophil cytoplasmic antibody level, a sinus CT scan, and a bronchoscopy. So again, this is a prime example of how looking at the stem informs yeah. how you think about the question came up with the diagnosis in your mind, now you've got to figure out how do I establish the diagnosis. A. A. Yeah. No. So if you B. if you knew C. that coming off the off the bat looking at the question. A. Okay. Yeah. A. So you think it's D? Okay. Need a we need a bronchoscopy? So so to diagnose A B P A you need the skin test, you need the zero IG. So what information? So what information did you get? This is a 39-year-old man. He has a history of asthma. Poorly controlled. You know, he doesn't have any, you know, sinus postnasal drip syndromes. He's got a normal white count, but he's got peripheral eosinophilia. With a fleeting infiltrate. So. What I think are they trying to get you? And he's got vocal signs. So he's in a wrong kind of right upper lung. Okay. I think what the tr the question is trying to confuse you in the differential diagnosis of a poorly controlled asthma in a young patient. Right. So and then you, they give you the isinophilia and makes you think about what what's the differential diagnosis for that for yeah, right. charge straws. So yeah. charge straws. Exactly. So think about the differential diagnosis of the poorly controlled asthmatic patient. So what kind of things are on your differential? So Church Strauss. A B P A. So yeah, post nasal drip syndromes, GERD symptoms. Which so they, they deny gave you those they two. Do. They said so that he doesn't have it. Off the list. And anything else that you think about in the poorly controlled asthmatic patient. They didn't tell you he was obese. You know. And then there are things in the stem that helps you rule out or rule in church straws. So even though he has peripheral azinophilia, look at the sedoid and reactive protein, they are normal. And suppose he had church straws. If you go to the choices you have, what could help you in there? Even yeah. For the church straws, even if you ordered a CAT scan and you found some sinus abnormality, does this diagnose church straws? It's not gonna be specific or sensitive. He is on it, so. What's that? Could be. But what more importantly is elevated in the ABPA that they gave you? His ESR was, ne it was normal, Negative. but what's elevated? Serum IG. His eosinophil count is 18%. Okay. So you're still left with Church Strauss and ABPA. Yeah. So now they give you a CAT scan. What would you expect to see if, that, if he had Church Strauss? On the CAT scan. I don't think you'll see bronchiectasis there. So you see some ground glass, some something they can have nodular to represent necrotizing nodules. So I give you specific cuts at the middle, and they show you classic bronchiectasis. And then this is a middle lobe. The distribution helps you too. This yeah. seems to be distributed in the middle lobe. And the last choice there is a bronchoscopy because he had this lung mass. And but when you look at the CAT scan, you know that all he has is really mucus plugging. You are not going to bronchoscopy that. So 
so correct. I said, I said, I said, you need to know the patient that aggressively, like we said, aggressive medical therapy for asthma, still poorly controlled, still symptomatic. He had peripheral eosinophilia, like we discussed, and the CT findings should be classic for ABPA, middle lobe bronchiectasis, and the sub rate, sorry, the sub rate was, um, and the CRP was not uh, high to suggest that he has uh, EGPA tridistrosis. The IgE test is the most useful because not only diagnoses it, but also correlates with the disease uh, severity in ABPA patients. And the level we're looking for is more than 1,000 milligram per liter. And like I said, the CT sinus is not very specific or sensitive for EGPA. And the CT endobronchial lesion it's, has high attenuation. It looks exactly like a mucus, so I, we didn't, you would not bronch the patient for this lesion. What makes you think about bronchoscopy? Okay. I see what you're saying, but I mean, I think the eosinophilia really. The, the degree of eosinophilia, 80% is higher for that, though. Yeah, so you, again, would you expect that if, if what they were trying to get you to think about was a, a, a focal abnormality, would you see a CT scan? Doesn't show you any focal findings? I just kind of hard to believe that if he's having ABPA and asthma, he's got three white and 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 three it's just in the upper, but it's both sides. <laughs> you all were in. I think the message well, is really poorly controlled well, asthma. If you overanalyze it. also this bits and pieces, you will get lost. I, I, I see why you're confused. I totally understand, but this is the question. Well, I just, you know, last week I talked about severe asthma, asthma that's poorly controlled. And one thing that argues for ABPA on this one is you have a poorly controlled asthma uh, on maximum therapy, and then you have this bleeding infiltrate and uh, at the using the filtered side. The first thing we should look about is yeah. And uh, we actually have a patient who is Eric in Dr. Morris's clinic, 20 years of asthma, not controlled, and, and then he has bronchiectasis, classic middle low, and maybe. And this question keeps repeating, trust me. Yeah. And that question, you'll see it so many times. We'll see it mul multiple ways. Yeah. But the key is the central bronchiectasis, the mucus plugging, the peripheral eosinophilia in the poorly controlled asthmatic patient. You'll see every variation of that in terms of how yeah. they ask you the question. But that's really what they're trying to get you to think about in that Well, she died. 32 year old female. She has a three year history of refractory asthma. She's referred to you for evaluation. Her symptoms began after she was exposed to a large concentration of chlorine that was being added to a hot tub. She was originally diagnosed with reactive airway dis dysfunction syndrome, and an inhaled beta agonist was prescribed. But guess what? 12 months later, she still has symptoms that persisted, and she has a frequent attacks of sudden onset of dyspnea and wheezing. She was given diagnosis of asthma after that, and an inhaled corticosteroid was added to the beta agonist. The patient relates no relief from this, as she continued to have frequent episodes of dyspnea and wheezing. Many of these occurred with exercise, though she notes that cigarette smokes and strong perfume would also trigger an attack. The attack typically results on their own after several minutes. One year ago, they were gi she was given oral corticosteroids. Again, this did not change much in her symptoms. She went to an allergist. She was evaluated. They did not have she did not have any significant allergy component to her disease. 
You examine her, she is not in distress, she is a slightly cushioned and rich on steroids. Vital signs are normal, a lung is clear to auscultation. Current medication, she is an Advil 550, Albuterol 2 Fox PRN, prednisone 15 mg daily, Lansoprazole PTI 30 orally once a day, and two sprays of Lonase as well, uh, once daily. Her FVC is 3.5 liters, 95% protected. If EV1, 2.8, 95% protected. And the ratio if EV1 to FVC is 80. She has a spire on the clinic, and this is the flow volume loop that you see. The question is, which is the next step in the management of this woman? Obtain 20, 24, sorry, not 25. 24-hour <laughs> pH monitoring. Obtain a CT scan of the sinuses. Perform cardiopulmonary exercise testing. Uh, or perform a laryngoscopy. So, Guido, inter wait, inter right. interpret that flow volume. Tell me what you So, there's... Uh, so there is a fixed component when the patient are inspirated. That means that there is a product of inspiration and that will make me think that I would like to do, I think there's an obstruction, but it's Where is anatomic it? obstruction. So is it intrathoracic or extrathoracic? It's extrathoracic, so I think Laryngoscopy? It's an intrathoracic. If, the, if it's the inspiratory limb, it has to be the intrathoracic. On the inspiratory limb, it's Okay, I'm confusing myself. Okay. Let's say that there's an obstruction. shaped. dysfunction in this lady. And so you would expect on physical exam that they will give you the patient is having strider because they have vocal cord dysfunction, but it's not very typical, so do not expect this in these questions. Could be you, they don't have to have a strider on physical exam. And they, they give you a typical <coughs> patient. The patient is diagnosed with asthma. They are typically on you know, so many medication and they don't have any relief. And in the stem, if you go back, they tell you about the characteristic of the flares, and they say that they have really sudden onset, and then they go away by themselves, and they, they are very brief, which is very typical of vocal cord dysfunction. <coughs> and uh, we talked about the truncation of the inspiratory limb, which is classic, but you can't confirm it, and that's why you always need to look by yourself and do the laryngoscopy and see what's obstructing there when giving you the variable obstruction. And laryngoscopy, what do you see usually? There is an inspiratory adduction of the anterior two-thirds of the cord, while there is an opening of the posterior one-third, looks like a diamond shape in the back. This is also not very classic. It can be variable in different patients, but usually this is how they describe vocal cord dysfunction on laryngoscopy. So in general, patient with asthma, poorly controlled, despite taking the medication, their episodes are very brief, 
and they come abruptly and they go away. And then the classic flow volume loop. Last question. A uh, patient with severe asthma has been placed on mechanical ventilation and a volume assist control for respiratory support. Initial delivered tidal volume was eight mL per kg of ideal body weight. The rate was 24. She initially had good levels of arterial blood gases and the plateau pressure was only 22. Over the next several hours of this setting, however, her PCO2 started to increase from 38 to 56. The current, this is the current uh, scalar of the ventilator displayed here. And uh, this is with a transient administration of an respiratory pause to see certain things. What is the, thing, the one thing that you want to change to help this patient who is having increased CO2 with asthma exacerbation? Maintain the respiratory pause that you see in the graph, administer paralytic and leave other settings unchanged. Change to pressure control ventilation, same tidal volume and respiratory and expiratory ratio and rate or decrease the respiratory rate. Can, does anyone want to talk about the graph? What do you see? It's auto peeping. So what do you see here? The pressure. It's not coming to baseline. Okay. So in the flow, you see that it does not go all the way to the baseline, just auto peep classic. And in the pressure, you see that the peak and plateau are both high, 60 and about 40. It was 22 when she started. We want you to think about the differential diagnosis of high peak and plateau. We think about poor compliance, ARDS, pulmonary edema, pneumothorax, and most importantly, if the history is suggestive of obstructive lung disease like COPD or asthma, then you think about O2 peeping. And of course, the way to decrease this is by correct this, decrease the respiratory rate. So we talked about the differential diagnosis and that this does not go back to the zero after each breath. You need to know that Air trapping increases the dead space, and that's why you expect the CO2 to climb in patients with obstructive lung pathology who are on the ventilator. And that to have air trapping, three things contribute to that. High minute ventilation, long eye to E ratio, and long expert three time. And this is because of the disease exacerbation. There is obstruction of the airway. They can't blow out the CO2. Things you can do, decrease the minute ventilation, either the respiratory rate or the tidal volume. And then the choices we had, the respiratory rate, decrease the inspiratory time, and of course give them nebulized treatment or inhaler to open their airways to decrease the expiratory phase. Thank you.